without further ado, let's get started. So uh, let's talk about what is Terra and um, why is it on the cloud? I'm sure you've heard that uh, Terra is a cloud-based platform. It is designed for um, accessing data, running analysis and collaborating in a way that is secure and is conducive to doing uh, really good science without having to worry about infrastructure and computing infrastructure in particular. Um, but before I talk really about what Terra does, I want to introduce the, uh, the problem that it solves. Um, and that is the question really uh, that goes with why does it have to be a cloud platform? And it, it really goes back to the data and the, the really impressive uh, progress we've seen in uh, data generation efforts over the past decade. Uh, really 20 years if we go all the way back to the human genome, which I believe it's, is um, celebrating its 20th anniversary this month. Um, and if you look at this figure, you see that the size of the data sets that are being produced, if we're even just looking at genomics, um, is really growing by leaps and bounds. And this is like orders of magnitude uh, in terms of increase over the years. And in, in terms of the, the data sets that are gener being generated today, we're talking about terabytes to petabytes kind of as a routine thing, um, which is really enormous. Now, that is a, a fantastic opportunity for science. Um, and again, this is not here, we're kind of focusing on genomics uh, data sets, but there's many other kind of omics data types that are coming into their own now, transcriptomics, um, all sorts of things that you can do with imaging and so on. Um, and so this great opportunity for science, but it poses a, a really important challenge of how do we maximize the use of these data sets? Um, particularly if you think about how traditionally we share data um, amongst ourselves, with other groups, with other institutions and other countries. And traditionally the answer is you, you plop the data into a repository somewhere that's maybe an FTP server and researchers who want to access it, want to work with it, um, need to go and download a copy, uh, often download a copy to their institution's uh, data center and then work on their on-premises computing infrastructure. And that worked for a long time, but the problem is now um, we're getting to a point where the data sets are just too large. Uh, it's become unsustainable to work this way. It takes too long to download them. And it's also really um, challenging to store data sets of this size, especially for institutions that might not have access to as much infrastructure as uh, we enjoy at the Broad. There's a lot of places that can't afford um, to uh, store their own copy of data sets that measure in the petabytes. And so we need to change something. There are many solutions that you could think of. The solution that is really gaining traction nowadays, uh, here we go, is turning to the cloud. Uh, so using cloud infrastructure, um, we can put a uh, we can put the data sets um, in storage in a place where it's co-located with computing resources. So instead of everybody downloading their own, co their own copy of the data, um, we can bring everybody to the data. So you just need to log into the system, bring your tools or use tools that are provided uh, in place already. And you can access the data, you can analyze it. You can even do some really cool federated data analysis where you're looking at different data sets and combining them to, um, uh, into more, more powerful analysis that can really um, uh, bring about breakthroughs in terms of the insights that we can glean from those. Um, so that's very exciting, all right? Uh, but that comes with its own set of challenges. It has to do with the fact that cloud infrastructure, as it's provided by the, the companies that provide um, uh, cloud resources is typically really hard to use just out of the box. There's been a lot of progress in that area, but we see that typically um, for people who are not 
trained in uh, you know, IT and um, engineering and so on, it can be really challenging to understand all the moving parts and to use the cloud resources adequately, securely in a way that's cost effective and so on. Because you have to remember that now, if you're on a public cloud, you actually have to pay for the uh, resources that you use. It works differently compared to using your institutional cluster, which is more traditionally funded off of grant overhead and things like that. And so um, this is kind of a uh, challenging new world for a lot of people. And I would say that that, that in a nutshell, you know, is why Terra exists. Um, Terra is a platform that we started building a few years ago um, as the broad started moving uh, compute to the cloud. And along the way, we've picked up some wonderful partners, uh, first Verily um, and more recently Microsoft. And together we're building this platform to empower researchers like yourselves to be able to access data, access tools, share and collaborate uh, in a way that um, uh, lets you use the power of the cloud, um, but without having to uh, become, you know, software engineers yourselves. And so I'm going to give you a little overview of um, the main things that uh, Terra empowers you to do, what are the main ways uh, to do work, first at a high level, and then we'll do a deeper dive in the second part of the talk. Um, so we're building Terra to have these core capabilities to satisfy the needs of uh, the research community. And each of these capabilities is powerful on its own, but when it's combined is when it really um, becomes extremely useful and valuable. Uh, first, uh, the access to a data library where you can access public and access control data sets um, that is hosted on the cloud by various institutions. Um, and you can access that data, you can bring it into a workspace, you can combine with your own private data. Um, and a workspace is, is this kind of secure, uh, shareable units where you organize your work, your code, your tools, uh, the data you're working on, et cetera. Um, you have access to several options for actually doing work, doing analysis work in Terra. Uh, the main two types are workflows on one hand. So workflows are sets of scripted computing instructions that can be highly automated and reproducible. And that's typically something people use for uh, data processing. Um, if you have sequencing data that's just come off the sequencer and you need to map it, call variants, do things like that before you actually move to uh, the downstream analysis where you're going to um, uh, extract insights from your data. And then the interactive analysis is the part where typically you're uh, interacting with your data uh, in real time, you're exploring it, um, visualize, there's a lot of visualization, quality control, and then a whole host of uh, types of analysis that you might want to apply to the data in the course of your research project. And all of this is in the context uh, of a data, data ecosystem. So I, I really want to emphasize this point because Terra is not just a platform where you log in and then you're locked in because that's where things are and you can't move out um, and you're just limited to what's in there. Uh, Terra re is really designed to interact with other platforms that are built by other institutions, other players in the field so that you can import data, export data, you can import and export tools, you can leverage uh, work that's done by others. And generally speaking, um, you know, move across platforms that offer functionalities that you need for your work without worrying about being locked in at any particular step. Um, and that's really very important for us. And that's uh, made possible by some foundational design principles that we uh, use um, for Terra that are that we use open source software. Uh, the system is designed to be modular so that it's, it's more efficient to run. It's also uh, 
reusable. There's you can combine the, the, the modules in different ways depending on needs. It's standard based. Uh, that's really crucial for enabling uh, interoperability with other platforms. For example, uh, we are interoperable with uh, the Gen3 data repositories that are run by the University of Chicago. Um, that's thanks to the fact that our systems um, have common agreements on, on how they talk to each other so that you can exchange data between the platforms and so on. Um, and it's community driven because ultimately the point of this is to help um, solve scientific problems. So everything we do is based on what we understand to be the needs of the research community. And in doing this, we're, we're supported um, by uh, several networks of other partners who have the same uh, kind of goals and aspirations. Um, um, among them, I would uh, call out the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, GA4GH, which is an international body that develops standards, both in terms of technology, but also ethics and other uh, uh, considerations that's, that come into play when we talk about using genomic data and other type of um, health-related data uh, to, um, to improve health care and other, you know, uh, biomedical related research. So these are kind of the, the partnerships and the, the foundational principles that we use um, to kind of realize that vision of a data ecosystem. And we also partner with um, various institutions uh, funders, uh, data generators, and other tool and infrastructure developers in various projects. Um, and this is just a small sampling of the projects um, that we participate in. And the goal in each case is to support a particular scientific community. Um, there's a lot of overlap between them, um, but we, we're really trying to um, make sure that within a community, uh, the, the researchers have access to the data and the tools they need to, um, to accomplish their goals. And that's what we're trying to do. The nice uh, result of these, these partnerships and these collaborations is that we're able to offer in the Terra data library um, access to a, a fairly impressive catalog of data sets that continues to grow um, that um, again, are hosted by a lot of other organizations. Some of these are hosted by the road, but the majority are hosted by others. And this basically allows you to access the data, uh, assuming you are authorized and credentials in many cases, if, if they're controlled access. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that later. So you can access the data and run analyses on them without needing to download or transfer or store your own copy of any of these data sets. And that's a really, really key point. Now, as part of that, I did mention that some of these are uh, controlled access data sets. We have components in the system that are designed to make the more bureaucratic process of getting access, getting authorization and so on, um, a, a little more streamlined. Uh, because traditionally there's a lot of human intervention and we've been working uh, with others to design a system which is now functional and, and operational called DUOS, the Data Use Oversight System, uh, which makes it possible to match uh, data use um, requests uh, to, uh, to data sets where the patients or participants have consented for their data uh, to be used in a particular way to make sure that when people, when researchers are accessing data, um, they are, uh, it, it is um, data that they can use for their purpose, for their research purpose, uh, to make sure that we always respect the will of the participants who um, provided and volunteered their data, which is a key pillar um, of a sustainable um, uh, research strategy. All right, so DUOS is an important system for us. 
there's uh, uh, of course uh, the more general aspect of security. Um, a lot of the data that we store is of human origin, many human genomes, which are possibly the most fundamentally in identifying uh, data that you could imagine in a way. Um, clinical data, various other data types that are sensitive and protected. Uh, this system is designed to um, house such data in a way that is secure and accredited uh, to fairly stringent levels. Um, and we continuously work to monitor and audit and improve um, security infrastructure to make sure that we keep data safe. And that concludes the high level overview of what Terra is for. Um, and at this point, I'd like to ask if there are any questions kind of at the high level before I um, jump into the deep dive of what it actually looks like to use Terra to do analysis work. If everyone has any questions that are on the line, please feel free to either use the raise hand feature, put it in the chat, or just go ahead and unmute yourself. If not, then that was a great excuse for me to get a drink of water. Um, oh, and Geraldine, <laughs> and of course, uh, we just had one come in on the chat. Um, how does Terra differ from the Hive platform, H-I-V-E, all caps? Uh, I'm familiar with the name. I've never used it myself, to be honest. Um, so I would have to, to take a look at it to, to answer that question fully. Sorry on that one. Thank you. Um, and that's the only one that's come in so far. So I, oh, how much of the Terra stack platform is not open source? Uh, none of it, all of it is open source. Um, that, is, that is a key requirement. Um, we, we will not use any proprietary um, software as part of our stack. Uh, related to that, there's often the question of can people um, take the code and deploy it themselves? Uh, to run their own instance of Terra. Uh, the question there is, um, in theory, yes. In practice, it's very difficult because there's a lot of um, DevOps magic involved. Uh, we'd like to get to the point where that's possible. Um, the, the obstacles are more uh, at the DevOps level. Um, the software itself is entirely open source and anybody is welcome to, to um, uh, grab it and use, reuse, modify as you like. Um, and if someone it wants to see that code, um, where where would they go? Is it just on the website? Uh, that is part of the complication is that it's not one repository, it's multiple repositories. Most of them, I believe, if not all, are um, now under, in GitHub, under the Data Biosphere organization. Um, that's where the Terra source code should all be. I would have to check with the engineering um, folks if there's any stray repos that are not in there. All right. But um, that's where you would start. Thank you. And Rachel just uh, posted uh, the link to the GitHub um, in the chat um, for anyone who's looking for that. And then I think one more question uh, and then we will move along. And is does Terra support other data formats such as image data? Yes. So in principle, there's no, there's no data that you wouldn't be able to use um, that I can imagine. I might lack imagination. Uh, but in principle, there, we're agnostic of the data types and what, what form the data takes. Um, in practice, the, the analysis modalities, the functionality for analysis that we provide out of the box is geared towards um, initially, genomics uh, data types. Um, we've been expanding to other data types. Uh, I know that we have some imaging related projects. Um, not, I'm just not sure how mature that work is. Um, and I would say, generally speaking, it's, it's, a, it's a question of how much you're looking for something, uh, things that are preset out of the box versus um, being willing to do a little bit of extra setup yourself. Um, yeah, that's, I right. that answers the question. Yes. Thank you, um, Geraldine. And 
everyone, please feel free to keep putting questions into the chat um, and we can answer them uh, when we have when we have a chance. Um, you don't need to wait for breaks uh, to put those in if you have questions um, that come up. And Geraldine will let you con. Okay. All right. So moving on now, I want to show you uh, more concretely what it looks like to uh, use the main functionality in Terra. It's not going to be exhaustive. Um, I chose one kind of use case uh, related to uh, single cell analysis. Um, there are many other things that you could do, um, but this kind of gave me enough of an excuse to show you the main um, functionality. Uh, if you would like to use that functionality in a way that's very similar to what I present, I recommend you um, check out that short link that I have on this slide. Um, that will lead you to a public workspace that our, um, our team made for the recent uh, workshop for the BICCN, the, one of the brain initiative projects. Um, and that has full uh, run through instructions that basically run through steps that are very similar to what I'm going to show you, but just um, in more detail. And there's also a video of the workshop. The workshop was online and recorded, so you can follow along and work through it yourself if you're interested. So without further ado, let's jump in. And I'm going to start us off at the Terra library. This is, uh, you've seen this before. Um, this is a subset of all the, the data sets that are currently in there. I think we currently have 15, but I couldn't show them all on the screen. Um, I wanna attract your attention in the bottom left corner of your screen. You see the Nemo um, box with Nemo and a little brain. That is the data repository of the Neuroscience Multi-Omic Archive project, the Nemo archive. Um, and that is a data repository that contains molecular data um, that is collected as part of uh, Brain Initiative. And so if you were to click on that Browse Data button below the project description, um, you will come to the Nemo portal. So on the Nemo portal, uh, this is one of the screens uh, that allows you to, um, to explore the data sets within the archive. And you can see this is a separate website, so you're no longer on Terra. This is the Nemo portal. And uh, they have a data explorer that allows you to um, explore the data sets based on various um, criteria. And for example, you can choose uh, to say, well, I want to look at all of the 10x um, V2 sequencing uh, data that's in, um, in the portal. You can also choose by organism, so you can select mouse versus human. That's the main two choices that are in there right now. And you have a summary of the amount of data um, that that represents. So you can explore and kind of narrow down the data to select what you're interested in. And you'll add that to your cart. So it's, it's a kind of shopping cart mechanism, just like when you're online shopping, except now you're shopping for data. And once you're satisfied, you have everything in your cart that you're interested in, you, uh, there's a download button. I know it's called download, but it actually uh, gives you more interesting options than that. And specifically, one of the options is to export to Terra. So if at that point you click on export to Terra, um, there's an automatic handoff, and that's the interoperability I was talking about earlier. There's an automatic handoff where the Nemo portal will hand over the metadata to Terra, send you back to Terra, and give you the possibility of importing that data either within a workspace that you've already created within the platform, or to start just a brand new workspace um, and drop the data in there. Uh, once you click through the like two screens, um, you land in a workspace in Terra. So here this is an example that I've preset where I imported that data from, um, from the Nemo portal. And this lands me in the data tab of the workspace that shows the metadata of the data that I imported. Now, what's really important is I didn't copy anything over. 
Um, the data is still in the same place where it was originally sitting in the repository. But now I have the metadata table, including links to where the data lives. And so if I now want to do some kind of analysis on this data, I can point the analysis tools and they will go get the data run on it. Um, I don't need to copy anything, okay? So I've copied over the metadata of the data set that, uh, um, that interests me. Now, at this point, I can go straight ahead or add more data. So if there's you have private data that's structured in the same way, you can add it in. Now here, one, one kind of hitch um, that can be complicated when you want to combine multiple data sets of different origins is if the metadata is set up in a different way, uh, you can run into some harmonization uh, with, uh, speed bumps. Um, we have we have a team working on um, an interoperabil interoperability model uh, that is going to help with that. Um, but for right now, it's on you to um, make sure that the metadata is structured in the same way. Modify it if that's not the case yet. But you can combine data. So bring in data from Nemo, add your own data that your lab generated if you like. And um, once you have that and you decide you want to do some analysis, Let's look at how that works. So for data analysis, as I mentioned earlier, you can either run workflows or launch an interactive analysis application. We're going to start with workflows because that is the more common case when you, you're starting from, for example, raw sequence of data as, uh, as I've imported here. Now, what is a workflow? A workflow is a set of instructions um, set of steps uh, that are going to be applied to the data to arrive at the final result. That's what you're actually interested in. So for example, here we're starting from the single cell RNA-seq data sets uh, that's in FASTQ formats. If you've never heard of FASTQ, uh, good for you. Don't worry too much about it. But the idea is here you have raw sequencing data. What you want to arrive at is a count matrix that's telling you which genes are activated to what degree in which cells. And so we have a workflow. In this case, it's a workflow called Optimus um, from the Human Cell Atlas project that determines all the different steps, all the different transformations that need to be uh, applied to the data to get your count matrix. And this is set up concretely, this is set up as a script um, uh, of instructions and it's highly repeatable, it's uh, highly automatable. So you can apply this, these transformations to many data sets, many samples um, in a way that's very easily and very easy and takes very little human interaction, very little human intervention. And so it's very highly reproducible as a result. So what does that look like in Terra? Well, here we have the Optimus uh, workflow set up. Uh, this is the interface for um, the workflow configuration. You can see uh, it's written a little small, but basically it's pointing to where the source code lives in GitHub, in, in the source code repository. Um, you can, this is one of the workflows that comes kind of preset out of the box in Terra but you can also substitute your own. If you have your preferred um, workflow for processing this kind of data, you can import it. Uh, we have tutorials um, for how that works and you get to the same results where you have your workflow. Um, you set it, you can set it to run on specific file paths if you want. Uh, the, the more Terra idiomatic way to do it is to point at the data table, that data table that we imported from the Nemo portal. Um, you can basically say to the workflow, take, uh, take this input from the table as your input um, and just run on all these samples. You can change parameters if you want or just use the, the preset defaults. Once you're happy with how your workflow is set up, you can simply push the uh, run analysis button uh, the system will give you a little recap of what you're about to launch. 
which is can be very useful if you have 10,000 samples set up in a workspace and you're just trying to test one. It's very helpful to know that uh, if you've made a mistake and you're about to launch 10,000 um, workflows, you don't want to do that by accident. So it'll give you a little recap. If you're happy, you press launch. And what's going to happen under the hood is that the system is going to look at your workflow code. It's going to look at your inputs, the list of, of inputs that basically resolves to the, um, the paths to where the data lives in its data repository. And the system is going to generate machine instructions for each of the steps that need to be run on the data. It's going to talk to the cloud, um, to the cloud resources, and orchestrate the process of allocating virtual machines, setting them up with the, the requisite software that is specified in the workflow, um, retrieving the data that is relevant, doing the work on the virtual machine, and then writing out the results to the virtual machine. And that is done for each step in the workflow and for each sample in the submission. All of this happens under the hood. You don't actually need um, to uh, know how it works, but it's really cool to think about how this is all being orchestrated because it means that if you have 10,000 samples to process, you can just launch that and we'll just request as many machines as you need from, um, from Google with a few minor limits. But generally speaking, uh, for most uh, projects, you end up never having to wait for your jobs uh, waiting in the queue because the resources are pretty much ready immediately. So that's part of the power of the cloud, which now you can access without having to worry about how it works. But it works and it's pretty, pretty cool. What it looks like in the Terra interface is that you have a job management console, basically, that allows you to see the status of your workflows, how it's going, what steps have been run, and you can go um, and drill down if you need to see the status reports, if you want to go see the inputs and the outputs and so on, you have access to that. Generally speaking though, this is built to be automated. So you launch, launch it and leave it. And then hopefully when you come back, um, it's completed. Now, once the workflow has been completed, what's really cool is that the, the outputs are written to the data tables. So they're associated with your inputs and you can go back and find your outputs very easily. You don't have to go drill down in a folder architecture. Um, you can just find uh, your outputs in the data tables. And so that's how uh, the workflow side works. If you're um, running kind of high compute, uh, highly automated data processing on your data. Now the next steps, let's say you've run uh, the Optimus workflow and now you have the count matrix and you're going to need to do probably some interactive work with this. Uh, some amount of quality control, things like scaling, clustering, labeling cell, cell types. Um, and so this is, some of this can be automated, but we see a, a lot of it, um, it can, uh, it is often, necessary to do in an interactive way where you're interrogating the data um, and making decisions based on what you're seeing. And for that, the main functionality in Terra at this time is uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks allows you to run uh, packages written in languages like R and Python. And here I've, I've, I'm showing an example of um, notebooks with tutorials for uh, popular single cell analysis related um, software packages. And if you're not familiar with uh, Jupyter Notebooks, one of the key kind of defining characteristics is that you can, it's designed to work kind of like an electronic lab notebook where you can write commentary, you can write a description of what you're doing and what you're seeing. Then you can actually write lines of code, execute that code, run that code on the data um, and then have the results displayed right away within the same context. So here you have 
some description. This is from a tutorial. And so there's some description of what you're doing, a particular line of code that illustrates how to make uh, scatter plots. And now, um, and you see the plot appear under the code um, once the, the compute, computing is complete. And so it's, it's kind of a, a way to tell the story of the analysis in a very linear way. The way, it, what's really neat about um, the way this is set up in Terra, and I should say Jupyter Notebooks is not specific to Terra. It's something that is um, uh, used very widely uh, out in the world. There, it's something that you can run on your personal laptop. You can run it on servers. There are other ways to run it on the cloud. Um, what I really like about how it's set up in Terra is that, um, it works, uh, it's backed by a system that manages the computing resources for you. So you can um, you, you can take a, a pre-configured virtual machine basically and just do your work on it. Um, but if you want, you can customize that. So you can customize both the, the software that's loaded on it, you can customize your environment. You can also load, it, uh, load a pre-prepared environment so you can also distribute your environment once you've uh, customized it. Um, and you can also customize the computing resources that are allocated. So if you need more computing power, uh, more memory and so on, you can just increase those amounts in a way that's very flexible um, and doesn't require you messing with um, uh, complicated consoles in, for example, the Google Cloud Console. Here there's kind of a simple menu uh, where the relevant fields are exposed. You can customize and then you can get on with your work. I think it's pretty neat. Um, yes, so Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I personally like Jupyter Notebooks, especially for things like teaching uh, or communicating like publishing an analysis, if you're publishing an analysis and you want others to be able to reproduce it, uh, a Jupyter Notebook is a great choice because um, everything is laid out like a linear story. Now for when you're developing a new analysis, that's sometimes it is a little, this environment is, is a little too constraining. And so there's another option, which is RStudio. And RStudio is the first, um, interactive application that we've added since uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and that gives you a lot more flexibility um, in, in terms of developments. And that's something that um, I think I, I talked a little bit earlier about the collaborations we have, the partnerships. One of the great collaborations we're, we're part of is Anvil. Um, and Anvil it involves is an effort to, uh, to set up tools and data sets and so on to make it easier for people to do work on the cloud. Um, and uh, working with the Anvil teams, we've been able to uh, set up a, an RStudio integration in Terra um, that's really neat. It comes with environments that is preset to run, uh, to use Bioconductor. And so it's really powerful. And it's, um, it really uh, makes it uh, convenient to uh, do your analysis. Um, in this context. Now it is still in alpha stage, meaning it's still being actively developed. There are a few rough edges, uh, but if you'd like to try it for yourself and engage um, uh, how far along it is, uh, we recently posted a blog post, and that's the URL on, your, on, on the slide, um, where it, there's a little walkthrough and a video so you can gauge for yourself um, how it works. Uh, I think it's pretty neat. Now, the next one, and that's that's the most recent development on the interactive analysis front, is Galaxy. That's also a product of the Anvil project. Um, and Galaxy is uh, basically an, a system with a graphical user interface that makes it possible for folks without any computational background to run command line um, tools uh, in a graphical user uh, interface environment. And it comes with a lot of tools that are preset and pre-wrapped within that interface. Um, that Galaxy is definitely still very much an alpha product, um, rougher around the edges compared to 
our studio. We're very actively working on uh, improving it and uh, the early feedback has been very encouraging. So we're very hopeful that this will make the kind of work that we're talking about more accessible um, to people who might not have any familiarity or comfort with command line interfaces. Um, and also there's a blog post with more details if you want to learn more. Okay. Now, it's great that you're doing all this cool work uh, with uh, important data sets, but none of this is a single person's work most of the time, right? Science is fundamentally a team sport. Even if um, uh, there are many parts that are done individually, I remember being a postdoc, I get it. Um, but ultimately it is, it is a team, uh, team effort. And so one of the things that we wanted to make sure uh, we got right with Terra was enabling collaboration uh, so that you can share your analysis, your data, your code uh, in a way that is convenient with your collaborators, including collaborators who are different institutions in different parts of the world, um, but in a way that's also very secure so that you know exactly who you're sharing what with. Okay. And so Terra has a system for um, sharing content that gives you a huge amount of control on who can access and use your workspace and its contents. So the workspace is not just a place where you do your analysis, but it also acts as a security perimeter around your contents. So when you uh, want to share data or share tools, you can share a workspace with somebody and you can say very specifically what they're allowed to do with what you're sharing. Um, and that's the basic sharing mechanism. There's an additional level of security that's called an authorization domain. That's very important if you're working with sensitive data. It allows you to determine um, the finite list of people who can get access to your workspace and to your work in general. Um, so that even, even uh, if I share something with somebody who's not authorized, even though I have the right to share it with them, they will not be able to access uh, the resource if they are not on the authorized list. Um, and so that's very helpful for uh, avoiding instances of oversharing, for example, uh, which is very important when we're, we're working with sensitive uh, data and sensitive information. And that's actually the authorization system thing. That, um, that is the system that we use also for access, controlled access data sets in Terra. So you saw in the data library, there's a few data sets that are controlled access. You have to have authorization and appropriate credentials to gain access to the data, typically because it's human um, data that is uh, highly sensitive. And so we have a system that allows you to, um, for example, connect your NIH account, log in with your ERA Commons uh, uh, credentials, and then that system will uh, look up, will, will connect to dbGaP and check what data sets you have access to. For example, you can see here my NIH account is connected. Um, I don't actually have access to data sets because I'm no longer conducting uh, research myself. Um, but if I was, for example, uh, authorized to access TCGA data uh, via dbGaP, um, that in my profile would be activated and that would allow me to go to the data library, check out the TCGA data and start working with it immediately. So it's a really convenient integration to minimize the amount of steps that are necessary between the time when you get authorized and the time when you actually can start working with the data. And we use that system for uh, mediating authentication, authorization um, with a few other um, projects. And so while we're talking about sharing data, um, I, I want to attract your attention to this showcase of workspaces. And these are fully public workspaces. And I like to bring this up because um, the workspace in Terra has a really 
uh, interesting dimension in terms of enabling computational reproducibility, reproducibility um, enabling education and so on. Uh, oops, that's a too far. <laughs> um, so these, these are public workspaces that some of them are developed by us to help people learn how to use Terra. Some of them are produced by tool developers. For example, the GATK team, uh, GATK development team uh, makes workspaces um, public um, as a way to help their users um, access their tools and run them uh, efficiently in the way they're uh, intended to be run. Um, and some of these workspaces are uh, uh, created by researchers who just want to share their work. And if you think about that, if you think about the workspace as a way to bundle data and tools and configuration and the analysis history um, of a particular research project, this workspace is really your ultimate method supplements. If you think about how we share, how we publish um, scientific research, there's still a big usability gap between your, your paper PDF, uh, which might have a link to GitHub to get the code, and maybe a link to data in a different place. Um, and maybe a summary, you know, a summary of the methods that were used, which is rarely sufficient to reproduce the full work. Um, think about how much more powerful it would be if with your paper, when you go to publish, you have a workspace that contains all the data, the methods, configurations, and so on and somebody can retrace your steps from start to finish. Now, it's not always possible to do that if the data is access controlled, but you can use, there are many strategies like using synthetic data or using example data that is open and at least serves as an example of how to set things up so that if somebody has access to the full data sets, they can substitute, just substitute the data definitions and then reproduce the full analysis. Um, I think this has a, a huge potential to improve the computational reproducibility of uh, the science we publish. And I look forward, I hope to work with many of you uh, to make your workspaces, your workspaces public as companions to your papers, um, because I think that that can have a, a pretty important impact um, on reproducibility in the field. All right, now that was the overview of Terra um, from the point of view of actually importing data and applying um, analysis functionalities. Again, that was not a, a completely exhaustive tour of all the things you could do, but that covers the main functionality. I'd love to answer a few questions. Um, the last part I want to show you after uh, this round of questions is a quick preview of the single cell portal, which is a portal built on top of Terra uh, for publishing and interacting and visualizing um, uh, single cell RNA sequencing data uh, analysis results. But first, I'd love to answer any immediate Terra questions that come to mind. Um, yep, so we have a couple in the chat. Um, the first one is from Bob and he asks what UK Biobank data sets are currently available in Terra with appropriate permissions? Uh, UK Biobank is unfortunately special um, because the terms of the UK Biobank agreements um, mean that investigators have to have their own copy, which is kind of against the point of what we're trying to do here. Um, we can maybe take this offline and we can uh, talk further uh, about what we can do on that front. UK Biobank is kind of the special one out um, because of those special clauses. Okay, um, so Bob will reach out to you independently about that. Um, and then I another qu a question about uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Mm -hmm. uh, when we write inside Jupyter Notebooks, do those nodes live with in Jupyter or within the Terra workspace? Oh, the nodes, the, the machines? John, can you uh, 
If you're still online, can you unmute or um, put in a clarification? Sure. So when I write a note in the Jupyter notebook, is that mm -hmm. note then stored in Terra or is it stored with Jupyter? Is it so is it like I'm just seeing cool. Jupyter through like a window and it's like if I sign on not in Terra into Jupyter into my notebook, will it still be there or is that not oh. allowed? Um, uh, unfortunately not allowed. That's an interesting, that's an interesting thing. I hadn't, I heard that suggestion before. Um, no, so the, the virtual machine is managed by Terra. I mean, it belongs to Google, um, but it is managed directly by Terra. So I don't think you would be able to log into it from outside. You, you are able to export the notebook itself. So if you save a copy of your notebook and you run it on your laptop, um, that would work. You might have to rewire a few things with regard to the data inputs, um, but you wouldn't be able to log in like using it as a login node, if, if that's what you mean. Thank you. Um, then we have a, a comment from Mark. Thank you for the interesting primer. I am worried if I use Terra for an analysis um, as Terra appears only to run on AWS or GCP and these proprietary APIs get obsoleted, Terra is no longer funded, et cetera. How reproducible will the analysis be in 10 years time? That's a great question. So currently it's it's working on, on Google um, exclusively, not AWS. Um, we are expanding to Microsoft Azure as a one of the benefits of the, the partnership that we recently started. Um, I mean, yes, if, if one of those uh, clouds goes away, um, we have to use some different infrastructure. Now, the, what's interesting is as part of the what we're calling internally the multi-cloud efforts. Um, so as part of making it possible to also run on Azure, um, our engineers are doing a lot of work to abstract away, uh, put some levels of abstraction so that in the future, it'll be easier to point the system at a different source of infrastructure. And, and the goal is really, like when I said earlier on, that we don't want anybody to be locked in. That does include us. Um, we wouldn't want to be locked in if, if one of those clouds goes out of business or decides that they don't want to do it anymore, whatever their, the issue is. Um, uh, we want to be able to use another source of compute infrastructure, um, but it's not trivial for sure. Uh, it's, it's a big dependence. Thank you. Um, next question. Where is the compute resource, i.e. if I have a compute intensive data pipeline, is the compute attributed to the underlying GCP or AWS and will there be billing ramifications? Um, yeah, so if you're, the way that that is organized is um, through billing projects. So um, you start when you, when you want to do work, you, you can log in and poke around without um, setting up billing. But um, once you want to do work, you'll set up a billing project that's tied, um, in the current case, tied to a Google billing project. Um, and so whenever you start an analysis, let's say I want to launch a workflow on some data, um, the system uh, will give my billing information to GCP and say, bill whatever this costs to this billing project. Um, when part of the work of expanding to multi-cloud is being able to have also billing projects against Azure and be able to say, if my data is on Azure, um, I want to compute on it on Azure and charge this to my Azure billing project. Does that answer the question? It sounded like it did to me, but uh, if the asker wants to unmute um, and ask any follow-up clarification or throw in the chat, please go ahead. And... Oh, and he and yes, it answered the question. Thank you. And then um, one more question or well comment from Sam Bryant. Um, he says, I can speak to the UK Biobank shared data set question. He manages a single data set for several groups currently at the Broad. Each group has an approved UK bio application. 
Um, and he says he's happy to meet um, to discuss. So if anyone wants to talk more about the UK Biobank um, data sets, um, please also feel free to reach out to Sam. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you so much <laughs> um, for contributing that. The rules might have changed a little bit, or, or I might be out of uh, out of touch. But thank you so much for for stepping up uh, with that information. All right, that looks like the the last of the questions in the chat for right now. Okay, then I will briefly uh, cover a single cell portal, and then we can expand to questions about absolutely everything ever. Okay. All right, so the single cell portal. Um, single cell portal is, is one of the portals that sits on top of, of Terra. So it uses all the underlying um, infrastructure, uh, but it is directed specifically um, at, at the, the use case of publishing the results of single cell um, uh, sequencing studies. And for example, so this is the front page of the single cell portal. Um, and when we say publish, by the way, I mean make public. Um, you can publish something in single cell portal that has not yet been published in a peer reviewed journal. The idea is really to be able to share with others um, the, uh, the results of your analysis. So let's say we look at one particular analysis where they're looking at um, single nucleus RNA-seq uh, in adult mouse hippocampus. I'm looking at the cell diversity. Um, you'll typically have a, a summary of the project. And then if you go to the explore button, you can actually interact. And, and now the, the data here is things like the count matrix and so on. Um, and you can, this is interactive, uh, obviously you can't show you that with my slide, but you can go to single cell portal and check it out yourself. You can interact, you can change the, the view. Um, you can make a copy of this and add your own annotations and things like that. Uh, so that's the primary view. There's several um, possible visualizations. Um, another visualization, for example, if you have a favorite gene, as you can do a gene search, either single gene or gene list. Um, and then you can look at things like the distribution across different cell types. You can look at heat maps and so on. So there's certain visualizations that are built in. Um, and I believe the uh, single cell portal team is working on adding additional functionality um, and visualizations to kind of expand the range of what you can do. And I would say one of the things that this is really cool for, um, and it's based on a, a, a testimonial from, from somebody who uses a single cell portal, is that it can really help streamline the collaboration between uh, folks who have different research specialties. For example, and this is the, uh, the case uh, I was made aware of, which I think is a really cool example, is somebody who's a computational biologist who's doing all the, you know, the, the heavy workflow processing on the data, um, doing a lot of the analysis, leading to uh, things like clustering and labeling and so on. Um, and then publishing the results of that. And by the way, you can publish privately to a group of collaborators. It doesn't have to be world public, um, but publishing to, to their group of collaborators who are uh, more on the wet lab side, who can log in to the system and explore the data. Um, and based on those results, kind of take that back to inform the next round of their experiments. And it means that they don't need to figure out how to work with count matrix files and, and, and software and command line and so on. They can just log in. And because the single cell portal is built right on top of Terra, um, and it, it uses a lot of the common functionality, uh, they can go back, they can kind of iterate, um, the biologists can give feedback uh, about the labeling and annotations, the computational folks can refine the work, and then push out the next version. And it, it really shortens the cycle of collaborations between them. I think that's a really cool um, example where this kind of technology is, is um, uh, just accelerating the process of science. And that's, that's really 
the part of that theme um, that I was talking about earlier, uh, where the system is designed to be part of an ecosystem, to bring in different people, uh, bring in data generators, tool developers, people who are using the tools and, then and, and themselves publishing the results of the computational analysis to people who use that to inform um, their wet lab experiments. And we look forward to working with more groups and uh, projects to con continue to expand that functionality and just reduce the gaps um, between different specialties and um, between possibilities in, in, in these uh, cutting edge projects. So that does conclude, oh, sorry. I wanted to say one more thing on this topic. All of what I've showed you today is uh, designed to be used through these graphical user interfaces. But all of that functionality is actually accessible through programmatic APIs. So if you don't want to deal with point and click interfaces at all, um, you can use all of this um, through either uh, there's a terminal interface for the interactive analysis, and there's these um, APIs that you can use to script actions like uploading data, launching workflows, things like that. All of that can be scripted if you uh, prefer to stay strictly in your uh, command line interface. Um, again, the goal is to serve all of the audiences that come together to work together on these um, very important projects. With that, uh, I leave you with a couple of um, links if you're interested in getting started. Uh, the first link is a summary of the steps uh, involved in getting started with Terra. The second uh, specifically is a blog post that explains how to take advantage of free cloud credits that are provided by Google Cloud um, so that you can try it out without having to pay anything out of pocket, which is always nice. And now I would love to have the rest of your questions. Thank you very much, Geraldine, for that great presentation. Folks, please feel free to put those questions in the questions in the chat um, or raise your hands or unmute yourself, um, whatever is easier. All right, it looks like uh, we have a fairly quiet audience right now. Um, so everyone, if there are no more questions at this time, um, I'll, we'll go ahead um, and end, end the meeting. And thank you very much, Geraldine, for the excellent presentations. And, and I'm sure you're going to have um, a lot of people reaching out um, individually, individually with questions. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, feel free, feel free to, to reach out. Um, if you have very specific nitty gritty questions, troubleshooting and so on, I recommend um, the Terra uh, help desk. They are much faster than I am in responding to email, but otherwise I, I welcome your questions over email or Slack at any time. I look forward to discussing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs>